must know the times answers to 25 essential questions on end time prophecy a powerful new book by dennis james woods the world is spiraling out of control at an alarming pace wildfires earthquakes hurricanes and floods devastate entire communities global pandemics kill hundreds of thousands of people social injustice unrest and lawlessness threaten our societies Political instability and the threat of war increase hostilities between nations. The birth pangs of distress are getting more intense each day. The question is, what do all these things mean, and where is this world headed? Unfortunately, at a time when people need answers the most, many do not know about the end times. You Must Know the Times, Answers to 25 Essential Questions on End Time Prophecy, is an eye-opening book that is specifically designed to educate readers on a wide range of subjects concerning the last days. This book will equip you to discern the times, in which we now live. You will learn what the Bible says about the signs of the times, the conflict in the Middle East, the Tribulation Period, the Nation of Israel, the Mark of the Beast, the Antichrist, the Battle of Armageddon, the Rapture of the Church, the Return of the Lord, and many more essential topics. Discover the powerful message the Book of Revelation has for Christians, and the perils that await a rebellious world. The Lord warns, Look, I am coming like a thief. The one who is alert and remains clothed, is blessed. Therefore, it is vitally important that you must know the times. Be aware, be informed, and most of all, be prepared for things to come. Get your copy today of You Must Know the Times, by Dennis James Woods, at Amazon, iTunes, Google Books, Barnes & Noble, or wherever books are sold. Praise the Lord, everyone out there on YouTube, Radio Land, and Podcast Land. This is Dr. Dennis James Woods, and we're here with you one more time with the Revelation Revolution Podcast. I'm so glad that you have tuned in again for this part three uh, series and how the imminent return of Christ uh, handcuffs and compartmentalize the understanding of the book of Revelation. And uh, what we're going to do today, uh, we're going to actually look at some of the scriptures uh, that uh, that are typically used to uh, bolster uh, the uh, pre-trib rapture theory, and then we're going to have some commentary on that. We're going to be using uh, Dr. Paul Benware's book, uh, uh, The End Times, uh, Understanding the End Times. Uh, Dr. Benware is a, uh, a PhD uh, out of Dallas Theological Seminary, and um, I'm thinking he's one of the professors down there as well. But he is a, a renowned dispensational uh, pre-trib scholar. So that's why I wanted to use his work, uh, and we're going to go through it. So at this time, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we do thank you in the name of Jesus for your love, mercy, and grace. We thank you for, Lord God, for leading and guiding us in all truth, Lord God. Give us understanding, quickness of heart, that we may gratify, uh, glorify you in the name of Jesus and glorify you in our lives, with our lives, and with our understanding, Lord God. Now let the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be acceptable in our sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer, in Jesus' name, we all said amen. Again, it's good, so good to be with you. I uh, just wanted to give you a, a few uh, updates. I'm, uh, we are still working on our commentary, the uh, my Revelation commentary, a verse-by-verse -verse commentary uh, on, from a pre-wrath perspective. I'm expecting it to be out uh, sometime next year. I'm not going to rush it and get it out this year. Uh, actually, after my review team goes through it, and uh, uh, finishes that part, then I'm gonna step away from it for a little while, come back, do some additional tweaking, and then send it, uh, send it out to my editors and uh, so we can get it formatted and uh, as a commentary and so that you will have it and you will have a quality product uh, by sometime uh, next year. So we just continue to pray for us. It's going to be a blessing to people in the name of Jesus. My basic premise is, is that the book of Revelation was written for and to the church. Now, uh, and everybody would agree to, on that part, but uh, I'm saying uh, what I teach in my commentary is that the entire, the entire book is for the church. It's not, it doesn't stop at chapter, the end of chapter three. 
No, the, the whole thing is for the church. It, it, every aspect may not be specifically about the church, but the bottom line is, is the church is still uh, in Revelation. I teach that the Revelation 13 saints are st the last generation of church saints. That is the church, but it is the greatest generation of Christians, the most courageous group of Christians that have ever lived throughout church history. And why do I say that? I say that because because Jesus said the times of the great tribulation are like no other time in history. There has never been a time up to Christ's time, up into his time, nor shall ever be. Those were the specific words of Jesus. So in other words, that means there's nothing to compare it to. So that means that the book of Revelation gives us the details of a, of a time period that is coming that has no historical reference or no historical comparison and because it is a, a very unique time. So what God did is he compensated by us not having anything to compare it to historically and sent John or gave, gave John visions of the future so that John could write it down so that we would have it. It made it in the canon of scriptures. He had to get it in during the first century while a, a writing apostle was still living and so um and, and that's how it made it into the canon of scriptures and and revelation tells the story of that final generation of church saints who has enough fortitude and love for christ that they are willing to stand up to the antichrist satan's worst final assault well not final assault but because he's going to try one more after the millennium but during this age final assault during this age uh, and and uh, through an antichrist under circumstances that no other generation of church saints has ever lived through. This is what the story of Revelation is, and this is the tr story of the so-called tribulation saints. Now, pre-trib calls that another group of Christians that because they didn't make the rapture, they were left behind and then find themselves in trouble, and they got to get their head cut off to get saved, and which is a ridiculous ridiculous narrative that is not what the Bible is telling us there is nothing in the book of Revelation in the slightest indication that tells you that the uh, saints during that time were they, they were weak back sitting slitten saints that had to make up for it by dying for the Lord no these were saints that had such fortitude just like the first century saints just like Peter and Paul and all of them they were ready to die they were willing to die uh, glory to God. They gave it up for Jesus. See, we don't have that mindset today because we think uh, uh, be, being martyred or going through is is a is a shameful thing. No, uh, 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 John and, and Jesus told Peter. He said, "This is the death you are going to glorify me by." We glorify the Lord. Paul said that I might get to know Him and the power of His resurrection being made conformable to His death and the sufferings of Christ. See, Paul. Paul said, I want to get to know him in that. I want to be united with Christ in his sufferings. And the Bible says we don't, we're not just called to believe on Christ. We're also called to suffer for his sake. So Revelation is the story of the last generation of church saints, the ones that's going to be in, that you end up seeing in Revelation chapter 7, being honored in heaven and everything. Every time you see them, even their souls are under the altar in an esteemed place in heaven. They're, they're, they are inextricably connected to heaven. But the way they get there is through fortitude and standing, facing Satan, facing the Antichrist without bowing. And so we've never heard this narrative before. We've always heard the Jerry Jenkins, Tim LaHaye story that they were the left behinds, the Namby Pamby Christians that just didn't make it. And they was fornicating and smoking spleefs and getting high and, and running around town and not going to church and not paying their tithes. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know what that is, right? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> they were doing all this untoward stuff, right? <laughs> and they, so now they get cut off. And, and and because they get cut off, they don't make the rapture cut, then they have to get their heads cut off <laughs> in order to be saved. And this is like not desirable by today's Christians at all because we don't know anything about suffering because we're so spoiled in the United States. We In the United States, we think we're not going through nothing even though Christians are dying every day. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, get the magazine Book of Martyrs. 
you will hear about the martyrdom of saints all over the world that's happening right now in the 21st century. There are thousands of people being killed every year, excuse me, uh, for the name of Jesus, and they're not taken down. They're standing up for the Lord. Glory to God. And they're not going back on their faith. They're not being the cowards that we see in Revelation 21. That is a serious indictment ladies and gentlemen, about being a coward. So let's get into, and let me share my screen. I don't want to talk too much because I don't want to be on here too long. You know, I get excited. I get to go and I don't know how when to stop. And then stuff gets very difficult for you guys. <laughs> Dr. Woods, you're moving too fast. I have one of my one of my students said, Dr. Woods, you be moving fast. Well, he said, I got to rewind it and stuff like that. Thank God this is on tape. So you guys can go back, you can play it over, you know, listen to it three, four times, you know, and then that way you can really get something out of it. You can enjoy the lesson. Okay, now, so let's get into this. Um, let's do some preliminaries. Let's go back what Reynolds Showers says about uh, the, uh, the concept of the doctrine of imminence. And then we're going to look at the scriptures they did, uh, uh, that they use. Okay, so it says uh, the word imminent is not found in the Bible. <laughs> Note number one, this is this not is not in the Bible, okay? Well, that by itself is a lot of a lot of words is, aren't in the Bible, but I'm just saying point number one is not in the Bible, but has become the word to express the theological idea of an any moment coming of Christ. So this is a theological idea. And what that means is it was created by scholars based on the word that's not found in the Bible. So this is how we start our point in eminence. Now, the doctrine of eminence is how pre-trib, uh, they, they make everything have to fit to the concept that they created, and that's how they interpret major passages in dealing with the rapture of the church or the revealing of the Antichrist and all of that stuff, because they use that to say, you know, uh, 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 this is how the rapture is going to happen, and they and they and they place the rapture in this box, and it can only happen according to the doctrine that they create, the theological concept that they created based on the word that's not in the Bible. Okay, so so this is how we start in it. This is, you know, we got to be honest about it, and even he's honest about it. It's a theological concept. Okay, theologians made this. It, 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 it's 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 something that we will will search out. Look at what it says. An intimate event is one that is always overhanging, is constantly ready to befall. Okay, or overtake a person. It's always close at hand in the sense that it could happen at any moment. Now, this is an interesting thing they say here. Other things may happen before an imminent event, but nothing must take place before it happens. If something else must take place before an imminent event can happen, that event is not imminent. The necessity of something taking place first destroys the concept of imminency. And I agree with that. Now, he is right about that. The problem is, it's a whole lot of signs that things that happen before the rapture is going to happen, ladies and gentlemen. But how they deal with that is they created the doctor to categorize those events so they get away with still being pre-trib, even though the Bible is full of signs that have to happen that are going to occur. But how they account for it is something might happen before this event happens, but it didn't have to happen, even though it happened. So let's say like, uh, for example, the there were many prophecies in the Bible concerning the uh, uh, God regathering Israel, pulling them out from all the countries and sending them back to their own homeland. We see in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, where it talks about the invasion of Gog and Magog, who's going to come with Persia, Libya, Ethiopia, to Garmouth of the North Quarters, which is Turkey, Persia's modern day Iran, all of that stuff. Eventually, it says in the latter years, you will come back to the land that was brought back from the sword, which has always been laid, laid waste, but is now gathered out of many nations into the mountains of Israel. And so what, what he, the, the prophecy is, is that God's going to take his people that are scattered around the world, bring them back to Israel, and in the latter years, so this all occurs in the latter years. So ever since we've been uh, in, uh, since on the other side of May, May 14, 1948, when Israel was birthed in a day, as prophesied in Isaiah 66, oh, glory to God, uh, uh, we've been technically in those latter years. Years. Okay, so now, ladies and gentlemen, 
uh, the resurgence of Israel was something that had to happen before the rapture happened. Why? Because it's in our Bible. It was given as a prophecy. And before you could have an antichrist, before you can have the beast, before you can have the abomination of desolation, before any of those things could happen, Israel would have to be in the land to build their temple, to have a temple, to have the antichrist, to make this covenant, all that. All that would have to be in place. Israel was prophesied it was going to be a nation, ladies and gentlemen. It happened in 1945. The church was still here to see it. Therefore, that is a prophetic event that had to happen before the rapture happened. Now, eminence would say, well, it, it did happen, but it didn't have to happen. Well, how can you say it didn't have to happen when that's what is what happened, when God is the one who predestined it to happen exactly when it happened? So that means it had to happen. That, that wasn't some arbitrary thing. This is something that was prophesied and the church was here to witness it. So therefore, any prophecy that the church is still here to witness and is in our Bible, we're the ones reading it, we're the ones who's understanding what this means, then it's for the church. And it means it's something that's happening before the rapture occurs. So this doctrine of imminence, when it comes to say, well, that did happen, but it didn't have to happen before the rapture happen, even though it did happen before the rapture happened. It didn't have to happen. That's double talk, and it's crazy. But they're the ones who created this concept. So now, let's look, continue to go. It says, the intimate coming of Christ means that there are no signs or events that must occur prior to his return. That's what they say. Now, you can't find that in the Bible. Find in the Bible that says there's, no, there's nothing that's going to happen before the rapture. You're not going to find that. Why? Because there's also, there's a number of scriptures in the Bible that do exactly that. It gives you a bunch of signs. It tells you Jesus himself gave signs of his own coming. How can you ignore those? That's what Jesus said. Look, when y'all see this stuff, I, I, my coming is closer. And so this is why Paul talked about in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter, uh, uh, chapter number 2, verse 1, he said, now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, ladies and gentlemen, that's the parousia or the parousia, sometimes I pronounce it, the parousia, parousia, that's the parousia and our gathering together to him. That's the rapture. Paul is addressing both things under the heading of the coming of our Lord and the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord in that context is talking about both issues that Paul uh, uh, identified in the first verse. He's not switching ideas there. He's actually say, he's actually giving you the things that apply to both of those events, whether it's the second coming or the rapture. And the reason why I say that, ladies and gentlemen, is because like I teach, the ch church is still here for the Antichrist. Since he's still here for the Antichrist, that means the church is still here when the abomination of desolation is in place. So if the abomination of desolation is in place and the rapture hasn't occurred yet, which I teach happens in Revelation. Revelation 14, when the Son of Man gets his harvest, glory to God, and then after that, the, uh, the people who refuse to get the mark of the beast, they're seen in heaven. Now, I'm going to cover this in the next series when it talks about the sequence of events, so I don't want to get stuck there, so tune in to the next one after, after this lesson that I'm going to get into that. But let's get back to what I was saying. An intimate re event with the pre-trip says is the coming of Jesus Christ means there are no signs that must uh, proceed or take place for he could return at any moment. The imminent coming of the Lord is not the same thing as the soon coming of the Lord. See how this beginning to parse all this out. Though imminent, it may not be. Though it's imminent, it may not be soon. Well, they have to say that because they're gonna admit here that the doctrine of imminence is based on the first century Christians' misconception of when they thought the Lord was coming back. And we're gonna see that uh, as we continue in our lesson here. And then we're gonna get into the scriptures. Okay, now, um, it says um, the rapture is an imminent event and the church is exhorted to look for the Lord's appearance, not for certain events. Now, this is what they really, or signs, keeping this distinction in mind is vital to, the cons to a consistent interpretation. Passages demanding imminency would refer to the rapture, whereas passages demanding signs would refer to Christ's second coming. Failure to recognize this distinction and trying to see the rapture and the second coming as a single event has forced certain writers into a dilemma of having a second coming that is imminent in some passages and not imminent in others. Now, what he's talking about is the argumentation against 
post-tribulationism that puts both of those events together. I do not put both of them together. That's two different things. When Christ comes for the church and when Christ comes with the church, post-tribulation is putting both together. I don't put them both together. Glory to God. And the thing is, is this is how, the, okay, what you have to understand is the statement he made there is their theological construct on how they interpret the scriptures. Glory to God. Okay, it's not that MNC applies to every position. MNC doesn't apply to every position. If you're mid-trib, you can't have an imminent return of Christ. If you're post-trib, you can't have an imminent return of Christ. If you're pre uh, pre wrath you cannot have an imminent return of Christ. Why? Because we're saying the signs that are in the Bible do indicate that the rapture is getting close. The pre-trib says, uh-uh, that's not the truth. Well, if this was a biblical concept, ladies and gentlemen, not a fear theological concept, it would be true for all of the positions, no matter who you are, this is, it, it, it would be, it would be a rule that you would have to apply across the board, but you can only apply an imminent uh, rapture to the pre-trib uh, the, uh, theology, because that's the way they construct it. If you, if you do like I do and you say, well, wait a minute, the church is still here. It's not true that the church has disappeared uh, after chapter three because the word church isn't used. See, there's a lot of different arguments that they use to make that point. But ladies and gentlemen, like I said before, there are seven epistles where the word church is not found. They never tell you that. Second Timothy, Titus, Second Timothy, Titus, uh, 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 First John, Second John. 1 Peter, 2 Peter, and Jude. None of those church, uh, uh, books had the word church in it. Now, in reference to 1 Peter, in the King James Version, he says the church at Babylon in the fifth chapter, but the word the church is in italics, meaning that it was not in the original text and it was added by the translator. So that's why 1 Peter technically doesn't have the word church either. And so you can't use that argumentation. All of that argumentation is crazy. So the natural thing to do is whatever the Bible actually says, take it at face value. That's what you have to do. Just take it at face value. You don't need a theological construct to, to try to steer you how to think. And as we look at some of these passages, we're going to see that aptly displayed uh, in this presentation. So let's go. Let's go. So one of the first one of the first uh, verses that they use is James five uh, uh, seven through nine. This is what he said in these in these verses. James exhorts the Jewish Christians to live righteously in the light of the Lord's return. Set aside certain sinful practices. He gives exaltation based on the nearness of the Lord and the possibility that he could return at any moment. This is what he says. The coming of the Lord is at hand. Behold, the judge is at the door. Now notice that ellipsis there. <laughs> he leave, they leave out a very, very important part of this passage. We're going to get to it. Two key phrases in the verse at hand or drawing near, verse 8, and standing, verse 9. Both verbs are in the perfect tense, which emphasizes action that is completed. Therefore, verse 8 in James is declaring that Jesus is, has drawn near, indicating he may be well appear at any moment. Now, that's how they take that passage, and that's what they do with it. Okay, now. Then he says the verb standing in verse 9 is better translated as has taken a stand. The picture James paints is of the Lord is standing right at the door with, with his hand on the knob, ready to fling it open at any moment to appear to us. The opening of this door may not be soon because <laughs> we found out, they found out it wasn't soon because it's 2,000 years later. That hadn't happened yet, right? Okay, but it's certainly seen as an imminent event because the judge could appear at any moment. These believe these believers are are uh, 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 are are to live uh, correctly. So that's what they're saying. Okay, so let's go, ladies and gentlemen. Glory to God. Let's go back to the NESB. Uh, let's go to James. We're going to look at the passage, James five, and going to verse seven. Okay, now here's the exhortation. All right, now. All right. Therefore, be patient. First. Thing out of the gate, be patient. First thing, first thing he says here, be patient, okay? That brethren, until the coming of the Lord. In other words, be patient until then. You have to be patient. 
That's not just to the Jewish Christians. It's for everybody. We all have to be patient. And we understand that now because 2,000 years later, the Jesus still hasn't come yet. And it's a reason for that. It's a reason for it. But look at the analogy. Remember what they did the ellipsis there? They, 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 see, it's a reason for that. Look at the analogy he gives. The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it until it gets the early and the late rains. He said, you too must be patient. Okay? So, look at what the analogy means. The analogy means that after a farmer sows his seed, he may go weeks and not see anything. The seed is in the ground. It's got to germinate. It's got to start its root system and all of that. Then it's got to break through the dirt. That doesn't happen right away. A farmer does not sow his seed, close his eyes, and expect at any moment his harvest is just going to be there. Ladies and gentlemen, that is not what this passage is teaching. He <laughs> says, the farmer what waits for the precious produce of the soil. The whole idea is be patient. The concept that the Lord is at the door, what that it doesn't mean that he's ready to throw a door open at any moment. What it means is he's his his coming is sure. He is going to come no matter how. How long you have to wait on it, he's coming. So, so this is the analogy, but the idea is be patient. And then what farmer, again, plants a crop and then expects the harvest to come up fully mature to right at any, at any time? So he planted the seeds yesterday and he said, okay, it can happen at any time. Boom, there's a, there's, a, there's a field of corn. That doesn't happen, ladies and gentlemen. The farmer knows he's got to plant the seed. It may take weeks for it to break ground. Then he needs two other things to happen. He needs the early rains and the latter rains. The early rains uh, 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 happened at a different time of year than the latter rains. They didn't happen at the same time. Glory to God. And you need all of that in between time. And then once the blade breaks the ground, then it has to fully grow and be mature in order to be harvested. There's no farmer in life that has ever planted anything and then expected the harvest to just pop up at any moment. That is not what this passage is teaching. I'm sorry. The analogy he gives, it talks about a farmer being patient and having to wait for the former and the latter rains. You need both of those things. These are caveats, things that have to happen if you want to harvest. You need the harvest of the rain. And if it don't rain, you're not going to get anything. <laughs> That's what a drought is. <laughs> So, so, and no farmer does that. Okay, so let's move on to the next question. Now, then he goes, 1 Thessalonians 1.10. Okay, 1 Thessalonians 1.10. He said, this verse was uh, observed earlier in the discussion about the church's exemption from the wrath of God. But it also supports the idea of any moment return of Christ in Paul's use of the president infinitive to wait. The apostle commends the Thessalonian Christians for uh, commends them for their con uh, uh, continuality and expectancy of looking for the Lord's return. Uh, for the Christians continually, excuse me, expectantly looking for the Lord's return. Wait is a word that carries with it the suggestion of waiting with patience and confident expectancy. Okay. Was the, uh, was the Lord, okay, let me go back to the uh, uh, pay. Okay. It was the Lord they were waiting for, not certain signs and events. Okay, they always throw that in there, 
But we're going to see well, that's it's not inappropriate. It's inappropriate anyway. Okay, look at this. Paul commends them for their anticipation on the coming of the Lord and does not correct them, telling them that certain events must transpire first. Okay, now, 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 since he's put all that commentary of what they're not doing and what they're not expecting, then now we have to look at the passage and let's check Dr. Uh, Benware out here. So let's go to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter number one, verse number seven. Now. Let's look at the text, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, this is one of Paul's typical salutations or greetings that you find in just about all of his letters. Number one. All right. He always does this in his letters that are that are addressed to congregations, not like in Timothy or uh, Philemon or any of those or Titus. Uh, but the ones that have, uh, with, with epistles that are congregations at places, he has a general formula that he uses for his salutations. And they're, and, and they're called fairly common. We're going to see two of them today. All right. Paul called an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and suffering our brother to the to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, uh, saints. OK, uh, in Christ Jesus, saints by calling. This is the other word Paul used to identify the church. Uh, uh, John didn't use church the way Paul does because uh, 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 Paul got a certain set of revelations that the other apostles didn't get. In Galatians chapter 1, Paul goes over that. He said, the gospel taught by me. And I didn't receive it from Peter. I didn't get it from men. I received it directly from Jesus Christ. So he didn't get taught these things. Peter and them didn't get it. Paul got stuff that nobody else got. OK, so therefore, sometimes Paul uses the word church as in all Christians in the body of Christ, whether living or dead, from the time of the Pentecost all the way up to the rapture. That's the body of Christ. That's the church. OK, but he also identifies the church in the sense of sometimes he says the saints. So you're, he's talking about the same group of people. OK, so but sometimes he uses saints. That's the word John uses. OK, but let's keep going. With all who are in every place called on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which is given you that in everything you are enriched in him and all speech and all knowledge even as the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed in you. So you are not lacking in any gift eagerly awaiting the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. OK. All right. Who will confirm you to the end on the blessed day of our Lord Jesus Christ. OK. Now, here's an interesting thing I want, want to point out. The day of our the day of our Lord Jesus Christ right here. That's the day of the Lord. But the day of the Lord here doesn't mean wrath. The day of the Lord here means the day of Christ for reward. So it depends on the context of how Paul uses the day of the Lord. Right. So this is why in first the second Thessalonians chapter two, verse number one, he, and in that context, the day of the Lord is both the things that he was talking about. The day Christ comes, his parousia and our gathering to him, the harpazo, the uh, our catching up to him. He's addressing both things in that text under the banner of the day of the Lord. Well, here he uses day of the Lord in, in a similar fashion as being the day of reward. The day of our Lord Jesus Christ. There it is right there. Okay, now, so let's go to this verse. So you are not lacking in any gift, eagerly awaiting the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, now, this. let's go back to with the, the argumentation that our, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Benware uses. He says, here again, Paul praises the believers for waiting eagerly. Uh, for the revelation of our Lord. They were anticipating the coming of the Savior, not signs such as the terrible days of wrath or the appearing of the Antichrist. Now, wait a minute, bro. This is a salutation. Why would you expect Paul to put in here any signs anyway? Where is it appropriate to put the Antichrist in and the salutation and he's just now opening up the letter? Why would he say, okay, so this is what he was saying. This is what he was saying. This is what Reynolds is saying to back up eminence now. He's using, uh, not Reynolds, Showers, Doc, Dr. Benware and Showers too uh, and, and all the other pre-tribs that teach this. This is what he is saying. He mentions here, we're eagerly waiting the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. 
but he doesn't mention any signs that, that, that come before the eagerly awaiting. My question is, is why would he put that in here anyway? That's not something. So what is he supposed to do? He's supposed to go, let's read it the fifth verse. And every and everything you were enriched in him and all speech and all knowledge, even the testimony concerning Christ, which was confirmed in you. And then he says, but the Antichrist is going to show up. And then when the Antichrist shows up, there's going to be the false prophets, the beast and the, and the trumpets are going to blow and the wrath of bowls are going to pour out and then go to seven. So you are not lacking any gift and eagerly awaiting the Lord. Now, why would the Antichrist be mentioned in a salutation in the first place? So the fact that it's not mentioned there, he takes that to mean they weren't looking for signs. But you can't make that argument here because the, this is a salutation. This is a formula that Paul uses when he addresses all, just about everybody in Thessalonians. Or, I mean, everybody in the epistles that he writes to. We're gonna he he cites another one in Thessalonians. We're gonna look at that one too. It doesn't make sense to expect to see the Antichrist there because he's not talking about that. The, our end hope, our citizenship is in heaven. So of course that's always going to be our end result is heaven. That's not a time to say that doesn't mean the church won't see the Antichrist. That doesn't mean that the, that the rapture could happen at any time in accordance to how pre-trib categorizes it according to the doctrine of eminence. Remember, eminence is not in the Bible. It is a theological concept that they created in order to parse out how they interpret the scriptures that he could come at any time. Listen, Christ can come at any time for me and you, yes, but I'm not pre-trib. I don't teach that. I teach that the church is still here. I teach that the book of Revelation is to the church. I teach that the, the uh, tribulation saints, the so-called tribulation saints is the last generation of church saints, but they are the most courageous group of Christians because they come out of a time that no other Christian has had to go through. Therefore, they are being honored in Revelation, and Revelation is the story of the Christian of the eschaton of the last days who stand up to the worst person in human history. And they stay faithful to Christ under those circumstances. Therefore, they're celebrated every time you see the tribulation, say they in heaven. Nothing bad is ever said about them because they're not tribulation saints. That is the church. And that's the reason why God gave the book of Revelation in the first place to give us these uh, the events that are going to happen because the time had never happened before. No, it ever happened again. So God gave us the play by play and we know what's going to happen during these times. Okay. So let's go to, again, uh, chapter uh, Philippians 3 and 20. And let's look at it. It says, uh, this is what Dr. Uh, uh, Benware says. Once again, the apostle speaks of the Lord's return in the context of proper Christian living. He encourages the Philippian Christians to live in a manner that is pleasing to the Lord, accurately reflects their citizenship. We eagerly await for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into the conformity with his body. Then it says, wait is a compound word, okay, uh, that speaks of not only anticipating the Lord's arrival, but the intense focus on that event. In the context of Philippians 3, the apostle is encouraging believers not to look back to the uh, not to look back, but to focus intently on the finish line of the future. It is noteworthy that Paul includes himself in, uh, in the eager anticipa anticipation of the Lord's return. Even though Paul was getting older and was facing possible death when he wrote Philippians, he still believed that he might see the Lord without dying first. Okay, well, let's, let's, let's just deal with all of that. Okay, let's look at this. All right, four. This is what it says. For our citizenship is in heaven, which we, we, which we eagerly await for the Lord. Okay, so now, ladies and gentlemen, Paul understood that the church consisted of people who God had foreknew before the foundation of the world. Okay, let me, let me, let's, let's just break this down. 2 Timothy 1, 9. Look at what the Bible says. Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose 
and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. The King James says, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Ladies and gentlemen, this is an interesting passage because that means Paul understood that the, that the body of Christianity was something that God foreknew according to his purpose. It was never God's purpose to come in the first century. And the reason why it wasn't his purpose is because he was thinking about you and me in the 20th century, in the 21st century, and all of this, the, the prior centuries or successive centuries after the first century. It was never God's intent to come in the first century, no matter what they thought. And even if Paul did, I think there's enough reason to think that he didn't think that because Paul had a greater revelation. And just because he says we in this in that text just simply means he's talking about the entire body of Christ and not so much that he just thought he wasn't going to be here. I mean, th that's it doesn't it doesn't make sense. So let's let's look at another passage. Let's go to uh, 1 Timothy. Let's go to 3 1. Now, look, this is the same apostle. Know this also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Look at this, ladies and gentlemen. In the last days. Paul knew he wasn't in the last days. He said, in the last uh, perilous time shall come. That that means. That's the eschaton, last days there, ladies and gentlemen, in the Greek, that's eschaton. Let's look at the, let's look at the word last there. Eschatos, rather, excuse me, eschatos. That's the word there, eschatos, okay? That's what it means. Last, lowest, latest state, the latter, latter end. That's what that means, okay? So what he's saying is, in the last days, glory to God, perilous times shall come. So let's let's look at it. Let's look at another uh, commentary. And this is this is a dispensational scholar that's writing what I'm about to read to you. Listen to what he says here. The apostle now gives Timothy a description of conditions that exist in the world prior to the Lord's coming. It is often pointed out that the list of sins follows is a very similar to description of the heathen, uh, 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 ungodly heathen and Romans. Glory to God. The remarkable thing is that the very condition that existed amongst the heathen in their savagery and uncivilized state will characterize professing believers in the last days. How solemn is this? So here's a dispensational scholar saying, no, Timothy is talking, telling, Paul is telling Timothy, he is prophesying what's going to happen in the last day. So that means Paul did not expect, glory to God, to be raptured in his lifetime. He's already telling Timothy, this is what's going to happen in the future. <laughs> So how are you then going to come right back and say, Paul expected the rapture to happen uh, without him dying first? Now that's, see, this is crazy. Why would you say that? Why would you say that? And even, so he, I notice what he says here uh, when he wrote Philippians. Well, it doesn't make a difference because now we have all of what Paul wrote and we know that since Paul did, since the rapture didn't happen in the first century and since, and since the, the Lord didn't come before Paul died, see, we know that now. So it's no need in trying to go back and use the Philippians. Well, when he wrote Philippians, no, that doesn't make sense because you already know. We already had a whole Bible. You should know by this point that it didn't happen then and Paul couldn't have thought that. Let me give you another reason why Paul couldn't have thought that, that the Lord was coming before he died. Glory to God. See, this is, this is, this is, this is why, ladies and gentlemen, look, you have to know your own Bible. And this is why I encourage people, oh, glory to God, to do their own research. You just have to do this yourself. This is what Paul says. Okay, now. This is what he tells, this is what he t t tells Timothy. All right. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust, they will heap unto themselves having itching ears and they will turn away their ears from the truth and she'll be turned to fables. 
He said, but watch it out in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of your ministry. So now this is Paul's instructions before he dies to Timothy, which he obviously expected Timothy to fulfill his mission. That's why he's giving him a charge. He didn't say, Timothy, I'm about to die. Be looking for the Lord. He's coming any minute. He can come at any time. Be looking up. That's why those angels told the guys of Galilee, say, why are y'all wasting time looking up? Get busy. You wasting time. He, when he come back in his own life matter, Jesus said, if, are you, they asked Jesus, are you coming back to restore? He said, that's none of your business. None of your business. Don't worry about that. You're going to do what I told you to do. Father, that, that's, the, that's in the Father's hand, not yours. Okay? Now look at what he says. But watch thou in all things Endure affliction, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of, your, of thy ministry. Listen to this. For I, I'm not talking about him, Paul talking about himself, am now ready to be offered. And the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. How can you sit there with a straight face and say that Paul thought the rapture would happen before he died? You got the scriptures of him here, right here saying that this is what he knew was about to happen. And even if you try to use the argument, well, I said at the time he wrote Philippians, it doesn't make a difference because you, by, by this time, we, but you have Timothy here too. And so since you know what Timothy said, you have no business trying to say, Paul, believe that when I can turn to Timothy and, and, and make what you're saying crazy. You shouldn't have even said that. Why would you say that? It doesn't make sense to say that when you have what really Paul would happen to Paul. Paul got his head cut off. That's what happened. But the rapture did not happen before he died. Glory to God. Now, except 1 Thessalonians. Let's go there. Try to get all these in. 1 Thessalonians 4, 15. All right, now this is what he says. For this I say, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain. Now you notice he says we. All right now. And this is what uh, uh, Doctor uh, Benware says. For this we say unto you. I'm over here now. See with my cursor. He says, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain to the coming of the Lord shall not precede those who fall asleep. And using the personal pronoun we, Paul includes himself in the group of believers that would be called up to meet the Lord in the air. Of course, he, <laughs> of course he included himself. He's a Christian, ain't he? <laughs> so when the Lord comes back, Paul's going to be resurrected like anybody else. We're all going to be, we're all going to be there. That didn't mean he meant that it was the we meant that he expected that this to happen during his lifetime. It's just simply he's saying the body of Christ, we, all of us, first century Christians, second century, 20, 21st century, and however many it go, it's, we're, we're all the we. This is another very flimsy argument, ladies and gentlemen. This is what they use to base the doctrine of eminence, okay? In a number of passages, Paul's wording strongly suggests his belief that he might see the Lord's return and not die since he did not know the exact time of the Lord's coming. He could not be sure. Well, if he couldn't be sure, he wouldn't have been saying that it's going to happen in his lifetime because he was the same one who said uh, uh, that we were saved not by works of righteousness that we have done, but, but, but by the Holy Ghost, which he gave to us before the, founded, before the world began. <laughs> Glory to God. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Okay. So, again, let's go further. All right, now. All right, Titus 2.13. Again, in this context, uh, the, in the context of righteous living, Paul says that we should be looking for the blessed hope in the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christians are re reminded to have a glad expectancy of the blessed of the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
This is the proper anticipation, not the terrible days of the tribulation, which certainly would not be viewed as anyone as being a blessed hope. Now, let's just deal with that. Because, see, see, we, we got to go to the scriptures on this one. Look at what he said here, ladies and gentlemen, which certainly would not be viewed at, by anyone as a blessed hope. The terrible days of the tribulation, which will not be seen as a blessed hope. In other words, if you still here for that, how could you say that? How could you say he's a blessed hope and that you got to be here during the tribulation? Let me show you why the blessed hope and why this is such a fallacy, ladies and gentlemen. See, this is why you have to know the Bible. You have to know the scriptures for yourself, ladies and gentlemen. Listen to this. <laughs> All right. Now, after the second angel, this is what happens. The third angel it says the third angel followed and said to them with a loud voice if any man receives the uh, uh, worship worships the beast receive his image receive his mark on his forehead or in his hand the same shall drink the wine of the wrath of God which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of holy angels in the presence of the lamb and the smoke of that torment ascend up, up forever and ever they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whoever is receiving the mark of his name okay now so now, now here's what now this is the grace of god still working during the time of the issue the beast what happens ladies and gentlemen I'm, 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 I'm gonna go through this in the sequence of events but this is just preview for the next series okay now god sends an angel to the planet to warn people this is off the chain off the chain this is the grace of God still working because he knows if people get that mark, it's a one-way ticket to hell. So instead of instead of people being ignorant about it and what just in case they didn't read the book of Revelation, guess what he does? He sends an angel to the planet to tell people don't get the mark. He issues a new commandment from heaven not to get the mark of the beast. And this is the consequence if you do. So right after that angel does that, okay? Now this is now this is what he calls for. He said, here is the patience of the saint. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. These are Christians he's encouraging not to get the mark of the beast because these are the people who are remaining faithful to Jesus under the worst circumstances in the world. That's why the so-called tribulation saints aren't these namby-pamby Christians. No, these are people with fortitude that God allowed to be persecuted and martyred by the Antichrist because they give glory to God when they die on the behalf of the Lord. As it says in the Psalms, blessed... Uh, 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 precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Glory to God. He, he told Peter, he said, look, this is the death you are going to glorify me by. This is why all these apostles, Paul and all of them gladly gave it up for Jesus Christ. Paul said, let me just go and I'm going to come back to this. Let's see, y'all done, done got me caught up again here. Let me run to Philippians real quick. Since he, since he was in Philippians, no, no, let's, 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 let's do the real deal in Philippians. This is what, this is what Paul said. He said, uh, 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 in Philippians, he said, uh, this is what he said. Okay. He said that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Paul said, I want to get to know that being made conformable to his death. If by any means I may obtain the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, neither were already perfect, but this is I follow after. I may at, that I may be apprehended that for which I am and I apprehended of Jesus Christ. Glory to God. He said, this is what he says. I want to get to know him. Glory to God. That I might get to know him in the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable to his death. Paul said, that's where I want to be. I want to walk the same walk that Jesus walked. I want to be conformed to that. I don't, I don't want to miss that. I want to be conformed to that, that I may obtain the resurrection of the dead. Oh, he was identified with that. See, we don't get taught that today. But let's go back to Revelation uh, chapter number. Uh, uh, uh. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 14. Let's go to verse, verse 13. So now after he said, here is the patience of the saints and they that keep the commandments of the faith of Jesus, then look what happens. And after... And I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, right, what blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from now on. He is 
is com he is pronouncing a special blessing for those who die during the time of Antichrist standing up for Jesus. Yea, say the Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit affirms it. That they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Now this is the Holy Spirit himself saying, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Now Reynolds Showers and uh, Benware have just said here, what kind of blessing would it be? It says, which certainly would not be viewed by anyone as a blessed hope. If they had to, it, it, this is the proper interpretation, not the terrible days of the tribulation, which certainly would not be viewed as anyone as a blessed hope. Now, who are you going to believe? You're going to believe this man or you're going to believe the scriptures? The spirit said right here, and I heard a voice saying, blessed are the dead. A blessing, a specific blessing was pronounced over the people who died during the time of the Antichrist and the Holy Spirit himself guaranteed it and said, yes, says the spirit, and that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Now, we're going to see something here, ladies and gentlemen. Then he said, and I looked and I saw a white cloud in him that sat upon it, sat like unto the son of man. You see that? You see that son of man capitalized there, having on his head a golden crown and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple crying to the one with the uh, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in thy sickle and reap for the time, for, for the time uh, has come for, for you to reap and for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud reaps. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a picture of what Paul talked about. The Lord descended from heaven on a cloud with the shout and the voice of an archangel. Christ gets his sickle and he reaps. Ladies and gentlemen, stay tuned to the next series that I do. I'm going to go through the series of events. I'm going to break this down. I'm going to show you how these saints end up in heaven right after Christ gets his harvest. They're seen in heaven after that. Okay, glory to God. So now, now who are you going to believe? Who you, that, that's all I got to ask you. Who are you going to believe? You're going to believe the doctrine of eminence created by scholars, the word eminent, not in the Bible, but are you, or are you going to believe, uh, are you going to believe them or us or the scriptures? Glory to God. Talking about who would see that as a, who would see that as a blessed hope if you still here. Here's the Holy Spirit saying, blessed are the dead who died in the Lord. Blessed are the ones who gave it up for Jesus. Blessed are the ones who had fortitude, who refused to bow to Satan, refused to bow to the Antichrist under the worst conditions in human history that any generation of human beings has ever went through on planet Earth in history and will never happen again. Yet these Christians are the ones who stand faithful under Christ under these circumstances. That's why the Holy Spirit is saying you are good with us in heaven. Blessed, blessed are they that die from now on. These people talking about how could they consider that a blessing. I'm saying what the Holy Spirit said. The Holy Spirit saying you're blessed. Now forget what they say. They don't know what they're talking about. They're trying to they're trying to handcuff you to a concept that they created called eminence. Eminence. Glory to God. Second Corinthians 16, 22, Paul concludes first letter to Corinthians. If anyone does not love the Lord, let him be accursed. In this word, Maranatha is interesting because it talks about uh Lord come. Yeah, well, we always we all want the Lord to come. That 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 doesn't mean that 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 by itself is not definitive. But this is what I want to get to, and I we're gonna get ready to end with this. This is what the, oh, this is I got I gotta read this to you because we're gonna catch we're gonna catch them good. Even more scriptures suggest that the writers and the recipients did anticipate an intimate return of Christ. It is difficult to get around the conclusion that the early church really did anticipate the Lord's return at any moment. They did. And, 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 and let me say this. If they did do it, they were wrong. <laughs> so you're saying that your doctrine of eminence is based on a first century error. They were wrong. Oh, they really did believe that. So what they really did believe in? What they got to do with us? What they got to do with us in the 20th century? What they believed back then? They was wrong. 
We have 20, 20 centuries, 2,000 years of church history to prove that. That's not a question. Now look at what they were saying. They were eagerly looking for the Savior, but clearly they were not looking for signs. Show me in the Bible it says, do not look at the signs that Jesus gave concerning his own return. Ignore those signs. <laughs> this is why the Bible commands us to be watchful. <laughs> what are we, look, look, how are you supposed to watch? And he, Jesus don't tell you what to watch for. Of course we're looking for him, but the signs of his return are attached to his coming. So why wouldn't we look for the things that the Lord said? It's like it's like it's like on, be on you you on your way to Los Angeles, <laughs> right? And someone tells you you driving from Los Angeles to Chicago, and someone tells you you could end up in 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 in, in, in L.A. at any time, and don't pay attention to any of the signs. <laughs> Saying that you getting close. <laughs> Pay no attention to them signs. <laughs> you, you can arrive in LA at any moment. Yeah, right. Don't pay attention to the sign. Now, if it's a sign saying you now there's some signs you might not want to pay attention to. <laughs> but 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 you'd be nuts not to look at the stuff that's telling you how to get to where you're going. <laughs> All these people tickle me with all this. Listen to what he says. They were motivated to godliness because they believed that Jesus could return at any moment. Let me tell you, let me deal with that. Ladies and gentlemen, if your motivation to live righteously is because Jesus could return at any moment, then you're not a good Christian. Your motivation to live righteously should be, number one, Jesus gave his life for me. Jesus Christ redeemed me. Jesus Christ gave me eternal life. Jesus Christ healed my body, saved my soul. Jesus Christ gave me the ability to then gave me a gift to go out and evangelize to the world. Jesus Christ resides inside of me through the holy presence of the Holy Spirit. I don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. I don't want to do that. I'm in relationship with Christ. How can I how can I go back on the Lord that died for me? The Lord that gave his life for me. How can I how can I do that? Glory to God. Not that, oh, I'm about to look at this, I'm about to look at something on the computer that I shouldn't look. But let me go, let me go check outside. Let me see, you see him coming? Is he is he on his way? Okay, all right. That is silly. Don't nobody really do that. Just think about the last time you or I sinned that we go out and say, oh, the Lord could come and catch me. No, what you have is an internal voice that speaks to you that says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Your motivation to live righteously is not that Christ could come catch you doing something. Your motivation to live righteously is that God died for me and Jesus died dwells on the inside of me. He's my savior, my lover of my soul. He's the one that lives inside, who lives and moves inside of me, who leads and guides me in all truth. That's my motivation for living Christ. I don't care when Jesus, he can go back another thousand years. That ain't got nothing to do with me. I don't care about that. I don't care about when he comes so much as I do. Am I doing what God, he called me to do? And, and when he comes for me, am I ready for when he comes for me? That's what I care about. Glory to God. But this idea that righteous living is only sparked by the fact that, ooh, the Lord could come and he could catch you. Don't let him catch you. See, the body, see, see when you say don't, let him catch you is that means if if you knew you know if, if don't let him catch you is not the is, is right not the right motivation the right motivation is the lord lives inside of me the holy spirit is going to convict me i know the lord sees all that i do the Lord told me we're going to stand for the judgment seat of Christ. We're going to answer for the things done in our body, whether good or bad. See, these are the things that should motivate you. When he comes, it's incidental, ladies and gentlemen. We only know his, his coming is getting closer because of, of the signs he gave about his own coming. Okay, now, so that, that's why I wanted to deal with that. They were motivated to godless because they believed that he could return at any moment. And if they thought that the Lord's return was far off, their tendency would be for sinful, careless living. Now listen what he says here, ladies and gentlemen. I want to, we're going to catch him again. 
He said, if they thought that the Lord's return was far off, their tendency would be towards sinful, careless living. Now listen to what he says. Just as Jesus himself taught in Matthew 24, 48 and 49. Uh-oh, what you do that for? Let's go there. Let's put this to the test. Let's put it to the test. Matthew 24, 48 and 49. All right, now. Let's get the whole context. It says, therefore, be also ready. That's the point. For in an hour, such as you not think, the Son of Man cometh. Okay? All right, let's go up even, even further. He says, watch, therefore. For you know not the hour that the Lord come. All right, what are we supposed to be doing? Watching. All right, let's go with NASB here. All right? Be on the alert, for you do not know which hour the Lord is coming. Right? But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time the thief was coming, he would have been on alert and would have not allowed his house to be broken into. All right. So here's the analogy. The analogy is the thief doesn't come in the daytime. The thief comes at night. So night is an indication when he comes. That this doesn't help a free tree of analogy that it could be at any time. No, the thief comes at night. Okay. Now, when it's night, you don't go. If if one of you is sleeping, somebody needs to be up watching. That's what this is saying. Because if you go to, and both of y'all go to sleep, the thing can break in and steal it. Then you, because you don't know the hour is coming. That's why he's saying, therefore, be on alert. Or as the King James says, watch, therefore, for you not know what hour the Lord come. But know this, had the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have what? He would have watched. That's the whole concept here. You should be looking, looking for what? What signs did Jesus say of his coming? You should know this. You should be watching. You should be looking. You should be understanding. When you start to see these things, he's, the coming is sooner. That's what you know. All right? Now, he would have not suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore, ye also be ready. For in such an hour as you think not the Son of Man cometh, fine. But if you're watching, you're going to know something. Who then is the faithful and a wise servant? So now he's saying, so who then is the faithful and a wise servant? Whom the Lord shall make ruler over his household and to give him meat in due season. He said, blessed is the servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, he find him so doing. This is what we're supposed to be doing. See, if you're working and you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, you're not worried about when the master coming because he gave you a job. I'm doing my job. So when the master walk up on you, you're working. You're working. You're cautious. Glory to God. He says, Verily, very, I say to him, to you, he that shall make, he shall make him ruler over everything. But now we're getting into what? Rental showers. Notice what he says, Matthew 24, 48 and 49. So now we're getting to the 48th verse. He said, but if that evil servant, the reference that he is talking about here, ladies and gentlemen, is the evil servant. But if the evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delay of his coming and shall begin to smite his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunken. The Lord, the, 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 the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he's not looking for him. So what Reynolds Showers is saying, this is what he is saying. He is saying, 
if they thought the Lord's uh, thing, uh, return was far off, their tendency would be towards sinful and careless living. That is not what this uh, uh, is teaching. What he is attributing to the righteous is what the evil are going to do. This is not what this is not the mindset of the righteous. The righteous are saying, "Look, I work whether my boss is not look, is looking or not looking. It's the same for me." The evil person is saying, is the boss coming? Because I want to be working while he's coming. I want to be looking for him. He's, he's only giving him eye service. He's only doing it at a time when the boss is looking. The righteous work because the Lord said work. So when he comes, when he don't come, when the Lord comes, he's going to catch him doing so. So what, what Showers is doing here, he is saying, well, if, if, if they if they would have thought, they, they, they thought the Lord was going to come right then. Because if they had thought that the Lord uh, uh, was coming uh, 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 far off, then they would have started sinning. No, you won't start sinning if the, you thought the Lord was off. Because if you love the Lord and you save and you got to feel with the Holy Spirit and you reading your word and you praying, you got a fellowship with Jesus, you are not trying to say, uh, uh, oh, this is an opportunity for me to go out and do something wrong. That is not the heart of the righteous. What he is citing here is what the wicked servant does, but he's trying to say we would automatically default and become wicked. That is not true. There are some people like that Jesus said have walked with me in white. There are some people who are faithful because they understood what God has done for them, and so therefore they remain faithful no matter when the Lord comes. I don't care if the Lord don't come for another thousand years. That is not going to change one I order, how I feel about Christ, how I serve Christ, how I love Christ. He can come another 2,000 years. I don't care. Well, I just want to know that I, when, I, when it's my turn, I'm ready for him and I serve him until the day I die. Just make up in your mind this day, who shall you serve? Make up in your heart who you're going to serve. He's quoting he said the concept of intimacy is stronger argument for the pre-trib rapture of the church. So let me tell you something. In intimacy was made up by them to make, uh, to make say, uh, uh, to, to create, to fortify the idea of a pre-trib rapture. I, excuse me, I teach that those, those servants that we saw in Revelation 14 and 13, where the Holy Spirit was saying, blessed are they, that is the last group of church saints. The book of Revelation was written to the church. I do not accept this idea that the church is not mentioned. All of that is foolishness. Ladies and gentlemen, the closer we get to these times, the more important the book of Revelation is going to be. So listen, my next series is coming up. Uh, glory to God. But let me, let, me, let me just go out on this. People want to talk about, uh, 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 oh, there's two things I want to show you. Usually people that have a problem, Ladies and gentlemen, with this whole idea of this whole idea of suffering for Christ. Let me tell you something. There's a reason for that. There's a reason for that. Number one, there's still not willing. They still have not settled in their own hearts. They haven't settled in their heart. They just haven't done it. They haven't settled in their heart if they could remain faithful under those circumstances. See, this is this is what this is where the rubber meets the road. Can you still be faithful if your life is on the line? Can you still be faithful if your money was cut off? Can you be faithful and do all of that, ladies and gentlemen, under those circumstances? See, the question is not whether the saints of Revelation 13 go to heaven. We know they go to heaven. Revelation 7, you, you, you see them in heaven. That's not a question. So is, you don't miss heaven doing that. What is the problem then? If you're before the throne of God, praising God, you have eternal life. What is the issue? So if you can't say, well, the tribulation says they don't go to heaven. Now, now if they were all going to hell, no, that ain't, that ain't part of me. But these people are in heaven, ladies and gentlemen. So that's not the issue. 
the issue is that people who, who have problems with this have not grappled with is would they remain faithful themselves or would they be part of the ones who Jesus says when the persecution happens, they're going to fall away. See, I believe what's at the core of it, ladies and gentlemen, is the fear of death. That's the core. That's the core of it. Let me look. Let me, let me look at this. All right. This is what I want you to see. All right. For as much as the children are partakers in flesh and blood, this is Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. He also likewise took part in the same that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. The devil had the power of death. But what did he do with it? You're going to see what he did with it. And deliver them who through the fear of death all their lifetime were subject to bondage. Ladies and gentlemen, the devil held the fear of death over human beings' head and because of that, he was able to keep us in bondage because you're afraid to die. This is why Jesus came exactly to die. Uh, 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 sacrifice and offering thou would not, but a body thou has prepared me. He was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. He came to die. Humans were afraid of death. And so because they were afraid of death, the devil was always able to keep us in bondage. Let me tell you something. Once you get over the fear of death, can't nothing stop you. Nothing stop you. Nothing can stop you or no one. If a thousand antichrists has walked into the room right now, all, like you all you already know, the worst he could do is take your life. But Jesus says, do not fear them that have power to take your body, to take your uh, physical body. He said, you better fear the one that's got the power to take your, your destroy your body and your soul off in hell. That's what you better do. Glory to God. So what happens is, People who haven't come to grips with Revelation 13 saints not being left behind but still being the church is they haven't come to grips with the fact of what they would do if their head was on the chopping block because we have a Christianity of ease. We don't have to do all of that, but the times are coming when that's going to change. And so therefore, ladies and gentlemen, this is why Jesus and one, one or two more scriptures that I'm going to do and I got to quit for real. Because I don't, I, don't, I, I don't like taking y'all too long. Glory to God. This is what Jesus said. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Are you one of his disciples? Yes, you are. You're a follower of Christ. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. See, that's not a message we're getting today. Listen to what he said. Whosoever will, will save their life shall lose it. This is exactly what's going to happen during the times of the Antichrist, ladies and gentlemen. People are going to be afraid to die, so they're going to turn coward and take the mark of the beast and doom their soul to hell forever. That's what's going to happen. So it's much easier to say, well, we're not going to be here to deal with that. We're not going to be here. See, it's much easier to jump into the denial mode and ignore the clear message of Scripture. The clear message. The clear message of Scripture. But we go, we go into this denial thing. No, that, uh, that ain't the church. That, oh, we going to be gone. And, and, and we got the doctrine of eminence to prove it. No, that's something a theologian made up and, and, and based on something that's not even in the Bible. Then they're using scriptures to try to justify which we just picked apart. Okay? And whoever will lose his life for my sake, you'll find it. Ain't nobody trying to hear that. You mean, Jesus, I got to get my head cut off? I ain't going to be no Christian. I'll come to church, but I ain't doing that. I give you an offering every now and then. Come on Christmas, New Year's, Mother's Day. But other than that, <laughs> forget it. <laughs> then Jesus said, what profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Look at verse number 27. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels. That's eschatology. That's the last days. That's the parousia, the parousia. That's what this is. And he shall reward every man according to his works. 
That's what it says, ladies and gentlemen. If you want to seek to save your life, you're going to lose it. If you lose your life for my sake, you're going to find it. He said, if you're going to follow me, be willing to take up your cross. Ain't nobody trying to hear that. Last scripture, we're done. Glory to God. Romans chapter 8. You, you know where I'm going. Y'all know where I'm going. <laughs> you know where I'm going. <laughs> we got to do this. Look at this. Listen to this. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? He's talking to the church, the tribulation. He said, will tribulation, even the tribulation, glory to God, the, will the tribulation cannot separate you from the love of Christ? No. Or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or the sword. Sword recommend, or means martyrdom, death, whatever. Then it says, just as it is written, Look at what it says. For your sake, we are being put to death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Now, how many times do you hear that preached in church? I want you to just let that sink in. This is the message of Christianity, ladies and gentlemen. We have, we've been spoiled here in America. Spoiled rotten. And don't think we're going to go through anything. We think we are better than that. We think we're better than the first century Christians. We think we're better than the apostles and, and, and all those people. We think we're better than Peter who was crucified upside down, Paul with his head cut off, James run through with his sword, thrown off a balcony. Paul, uh, uh, Luke dragged to death. These people died horrible deaths. Jesus told them, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house, there are many rooms or mansions. If it were not so, I would not tell you. He said, I'll go to prepare a place for you. I'm going to come receive you to myself. The same apostles, he said, let not your heart be troubled. Each one of them died a terrible death. They don't teach you that. No, they too, they too busy creating a doctrine and telling you go by this doctrine. Listen to this. But in all these things, we are overwhelmingly conquered through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death, look at this, and neither death or life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, listen to this, nor things to come. What are the things to come? The Antichrist, the tribulation, all of that, whatever. Nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing. Paul saying, just in case I left something off the map, or any other great thing, will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what we should be understanding. We should be understanding that the book of Revelation was given to the church. It was given as a way to compensate for the fact that this time that is coming, there was nothing to compare it to. And because there was nothing to compare it to, God did that something even better he gave John a vision of what was going to happen. How do you think we're able to know about the mark of the beast? The book of Revelation. How do we know about the Antichrist and the beast and the false prophet? How did we know that they're going to make an image of the beast? Energize that image and that image caused people to be put to death. How did how did Revelation know that? How did Revelation know, glory to God, we wouldn't, how, how would we know without Revelation, rather, of what happens in the first trumpet? 
You know, we're seeing all these fires right now. That's 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 first trumpet stuff. Now, I'm not saying first trumpet blue already. I'm not saying that. I'm saying dude, these are per precursors. And you already hear the narrative. Oh, it's global warming. That's what they're gonna say again when it's stuff. They're gonna they're gonna they're gonna account for it. They're gonna lie. But by us knowing what the Bible says, we actually will know what's going to happen. We actually, ladies and gentlemen, just, just, just follow me here for a minute. Then I, I, I'm going to go for real. All right. Let's say the trumpets have started blowing. Let's say that. And let's say they're audible. Do you know that every Christian that knows what the Bible says about what happens in the trumpets, do you not know we'll know what's going to happen next? The world's going to be freaking out. You know, it was scary. Looking at looking at Chicago, <laughs> the skies are red from Canadian fires. It's going to be worse than that. But we're going to know. People are not going to know what to do, but the people who know the word of God, ladies and gentlemen, they'll be saying, well, wait a minute. When, after this happens, guess what? The second trump is going to blow. There's going to be an asteroid that hits the earth. It's going to poison all the water. And then when that thing happens, and it, and it happens just like you said, because you know the Bible, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to shine as bright lights during that time, because we actually know what is going to take place at a time that has never happened before in human history. Do you have, have any idea how important the book of Revelation is? This is why it says, I got to share my screen one more time. I know I said I was going to quit. Forgive me for real. Though. Glory to God. Listen, listen what it says, ladies and gentlemen. Come on, you got to get this. Why do you think Revelation opens like this? Blessed is he who reads though, and those who hear the words of this prophecy and take heed the things which are written in it for the time is near. Why do you think God would put the book in the Bible if dispensational scholars are going to say, this don't apply to the church. The church is good. The word church ain't mentioned. Man, this ain't got nothing to do with the church. Why do you think this blessing is there? Why? 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 Why do you think that? I'll put another version just so you know what the NIV for. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are they who hear it and take it to heart. How do you take this to heart and you claim most of it has nothing to do with Christians? And we're on earth watching this stuff set up right now. Ladies and gentlemen, Welcome to the Revelation Revolution. Stay tuned to my next series in, uh, titled The Sequence of Events, Revelation 13, 14, and 15. God bless you and keep you in Jesus' name.